Jonathan Fulton, welcome to BRI Dialogues. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Well, I envy the temperatures you're in. I'm sure it must be warm and sunny and glorious where you are, but you're sitting at the center of everything that is connecting the world of energy, geopolitics, and what many call Middle East, but uh, more ever so West Asia, as, as we all know. Why is China so interested in the Persian Gulf? And how would this West Asian narrative shape the future of what we all know as Middle East? What are the big interest centers of China in Middle East and in West Asia? Well, first, you're right. It's beautiful here today. It's a beautiful winter day for a Canadian. It's pretty nice. My kids were born here, so they actually had the windows closed because they said it's too cold at 25 degrees. <laughs> And they're all wearing sweaters. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> they're, they're due a reckoning when we go back home. Um, so, yeah, what is China, how is China looking at the Gulf and, and the Middle East? I mean, I think there's, it's typically reduced to energy when you look at, you know, how it's portrayed in the media, right? Um, but I think that misses a lot of the more interesting stories. Uh, China, of course, does look at it as a major uh, source of its energy security. You know, it, it imports anywhere between 40 and 50% of its uh, oil and gas from, from the Gulf. So that, of course, is very important. But a lot of what China's trying to do in its foreign policy is, is passes through the Middle East, right? You know, China's Belt and Road is everything in its foreign policy. You know, whatever, however it's being defined these days, what China's trying to do is develop these trade networks that cross the Indian Ocean region or Eurasia. And the, the end destination, of course, for a lot of it is the EU, because that's China's biggest trade partner. So you don't get there without passing through the Middle East. You don't get there without passing through the Gulf. And uh, so what China's been doing is especially, you know, I think a lot of folks look at the Belt and Road as, as a one big thing. But if you look at it in constituent parts, the maritime side of it, the Maritime Silk Road Initiative, I think is the more important uh, commercially. Uh, so China's been uh, investing in a lot of port projects on the Arabian Peninsula, especially uh, creating these, these um, connectivity from Abu Dhabi all the way up to the Mediterranean. So that's a very big part of it too, right? Is, is that it's strategically a very important region. Uh, another kind of lesser issue, I think, is the fact that engaging with countries like Saudi, for example, uh, helps them with uh, their, their uh, Muslim population, you know, which causes a lot of domestic issues in China. So there's a lot of different things that China gets out of engaging with the Middle East. But I think the biggest thing, of course, are, is that that the twin uh, engines of energy and regional connectivity. Given those two issues, Jonathan, and, and you've been working on this for many years, established a, a very impressive record of scholarship and research on China's growing presence in this in this area. Uh, does that then imply that there is a sustained basis? that explains China's interest in this area, that is it now very definitely embedded in, in West Asia and the Persian Gulf? And given that energy and the BIR are now central so to so much of China's interests here, so if they carry on, definitely China's interests will carry on as well, right? So how, how is China embedding these relationships? Yeah, that's, that's important. So, um, you know, I, I started looking at this because I came to Abu Dhabi in 2006 and I was doing a master's degree in China's energy, uh, energy security and how it affects their foreign policy. My thinking was I was going to be looking in my thesis at Central Asia and Russia. And it turns out I was living, you know, at ground zero. So I, I started out by looking at energy issues. And the more I, real, the more I started looking at it, the more I realized that, that there was a lot more going on than just energy. And to me, that was the more interesting part of it, because of course, we all know that everybody is planning to transition away from hydrocarbons. And that's an important part of what China's trying to do. So if it's all about energy, then, then you know, it's not sustainable. But what we're seeing in 2014, uh, Xi Jinping at the opening of the China Arab States Cooperation Forum, he gave this speech where he introduced another one of these clunky titled the one plus two plus three cooperation framework. Um, and this is how China is going to, to uh, coordinate policy with Arab countries. 
Um, what this equation is, one is traditional hydrocarbons. It's the core of the relations. Two is contract contracting and construction and investment. Um, and the th three is renewable energy, nuclear energy, and tech. So what you see is that they've actually built a very sustainable and multi-pronged approach to the region. They've been looking at what Gulf countries especially need in their development needs. You look at Saudi Vision 2030, New Kuwait 2035, you know, all of these development programs, they're all about building sustainable post-oil economies. And this is existential for these countries' governments, right? They need to achieve this in order to have a long-term economic viability. And those line up very neatly with BRI. You know, when you read the BRI um, white paper, it talks about the, the different cooperation priorities. It doesn't talk about things like security. It talks about things like development, construction, infrastructure, tech, trade, you know, uh, finance, these types of things. So that they've been focusing on this stuff, and, and now we're, what, whatever that is now, eight years into this one plus two plus three, you know, it does look like a very long-term approach to this region. And I think they've got, you know, it, it does seem quite sustainable. The last thing I'd say about it is, um, you know, the Gulf, as both of you know all too well, has always had a lot of uh, interest from external powers. Um, it's not because of energy. I keep telling my students, it's because of geography that this region links up to everything else, you know, that you can't get to the Med, you can't get to East Africa, you're going to get through to, to South Asia. You know, it's got very enviable geography or very unenviable, depending on your perspective. And that means that it, it, you know, it, it's not about energy. It's about what it means for, for this you know, connectivity and trade routes. I think, uh, to, um, first of all, thank you for that quadrant of interdependency of China and uh, the um, West Asia, as I would like to call it more, more so moving forward. But uh, looking at the body and um, you know, uh, the body of humanity, it looks like the L4, L5, you know, that part of the world always in pain and nothing would stand on it without, without reinforcing it. But everybody lifts too much of heavy weights over there and they find that you know, it hurts after a while. Yeah. I wanna ask you a question, Jonathan. We've seen a lot of um, engagement from sovereign wealth funds and you know, uh, state-owned enterprises in, you know, in, in Middle East, West Asia, Persian Gulf, I mean, Reliance Industries, Aramco's investment. So far, have you seen a big movement from sovereign wealth funds investing into China the way they have done in India or in other parts of Africa? Is that something that you have seen beyond oil and gas or even in oil and gas? Is there something moving in that front? So there's always talk, sorry, there's always talk about this. And just, I think just yesterday, I saw a news report that, you know, Saudi and China had agreed the last time, I believe the Crown Prince was in Beijing was 2019. And they, they talked about building this $10 billion refinery in China. And of course, with, uh, you know, with, with COVID, a lot of those projects have stalled, but they reaffirmed their desire to, to come back to this. So you are seeing this. Um, each of the, not each, but Qatar, UAE, and, Ch and uh, Saudi have all established these, um, these joint investment funds with, with different Chinese entities to fund either BRI-related projects or vision-related projects. So you do see some of that, but I mean, there's a very interesting podcast episode. Hank Paulson um, interviewed uh, Khaldunah Mubarak, of course, who is the CEO of, of uh, Mubarala here in Abu Dhabi. And he was asking him about investment into China. And I thought it was very interesting because what you hear is a lot of, you see a lot of MOUs, but you don't necessarily see that turn into, you know, real hard commitments. That's why um, I asked Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you keep seeing these stories about billions and billions and billions of dollars. But of course, with China, especially since 2016, a lot of that is really leveled off or, or, or dipped. Um, and... Um, Khaldunah Mubarak's interview actually kind of confirmed that. He said, you know, we still don't know the market as well as we know, say, Europe or the UK or US. So he said, if you look at what Mubarak has been doing, it's still very heavily invested in places that it feels comfortable with. But, you know, every day we're seeing more and more outreach. Of course, we just saw last week when uh, the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Zayed and, and, you know, Mir Taman were, were both in Beijing and Sisi was in Beijing. You know, all these meetings are, are developing those relationships and, and leading to more of this stuff. So I suspect what we will see 
you know, when they look at these tremendously important markets like India, like China, um, they'll see nothing but opportunity uh, once they develop that, that knowledge of how to, you know, engage with those markets. I, I have a quick follow-up to that, Jonathan, and that is that you mentioned they're developing that insight and knowledge. How embedded and how big is China's footprint in West Asia? Oh, it's, it's enormous, of course. It's enormous. Uh, there was a really good article in Foreign Policy a year or two ago um, by, uh, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm whiffing. Uh, my <laughs> is my friend who wrote it. Um, oh my God, this is terrible. I'll, it will come to you, don't worry it about it. Come it. To come. But um, uh, he's just saying, basically, you know, you can see that everywhere in the world, a lot of China's investment is shrinking. But if you look in the Middle East, it's actually pretty stable. And uh, that's been the case, you know, that you've seen a lot, of, again, these governments that, that need this FDI for their vision projects for, you know, look at Egypt and, and all the stuff they're doing with their new capital district and, and all the money that's going into Haifa port, you know, uh, China's actually, yeah, quite deeply embedded into the region. So given, given that China is now definitely, you know, gaining traction and so on, where do you think it's putting its, its expertise and resources and so on? Has it got sectoral preferences? Is it the BRI that determines what it does in this part of the world? Um, is it the profit margins? Is it where it's competing with Western alternatives or other Asian, Indian, Korean, uh, Japanese, and so on. How are they approaching the region, and and where are they putting their their resources? So this is really interesting because there's a lot of ways of looking at this. Um, the way I started looking at it is, you know, we we all know China has this firm non-alliance policy. They don't want to get stuck in other countries' entanglements. Uh, so they've had this policy in place for a long time, which is why it always grates on me when I see in the newspapers, you know, China, it, Iran alliance. And, you know, I guess being a political scientist, I want the precision. It's not an alliance, it's a, a partnership. And that's what China uses instead is they use these, this hierarchy of partnerships. So if you look at which countries it gives the highest ranking of partnership, the comp comprehensive strategic partnership, that's where you see a lot of the investment, a lot of the projects. And in the Middle East, they've designated five countries at this level, uh, Iran, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and, uh, and Algeria. So those countries have really seen the lion's share of a lot of the contracting, a lot of the investment, a lot of the cooperation. Um, other countries you see aren't necessarily about profits, but about uh, strategic location. So Oman, for example, has been uh, very important historically to China. They've got a, a, a kind of a weird and twisted history together. But um, there came a point when Sultan Qaboos realized China is going to be a pretty important partner, and he reached out and developed the relationship. And they've, they've become quite important in terms of energy. Uh, in 2017, China started announcing a lot of big ticket projects in, in this tiny fishing port of Dukum. And we haven't seen too many of them come into play yet. It's been interesting. But um, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but the reason why it's attractive, of course, is you bypass Hormuz, um, you have access to the Arabian Peninsula and all of these energy hubs without having to pass through, you know, these tricky waters. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, it's just, it hasn't happened. At this point, 2022, 30% of China's projects were slated to be done. And I think all that's happened so far is one factory has been built. Um, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, because strategically Oman offers a lot of opportunity, but I think economically it, it, it doesn't, you know, Oman's economy has been quite more abundant in the past few years. And I think Chinese companies and Chinese business people have actually been leaving and coming here. You know, you've seen Abu Dhabi really kind of taking everybody's lunch for the past four or five years. Um, they haven't had to compete with Qatar because Qatar was isolated. Uh, Kuwait seems to ebb and, you know, sometimes it's talking, you know, like Madina al Harir is going to drive everything and then whoever's in charge of that portfolio gets shuffled out and then it goes to nothing. So in some places it's been, you know, up and down. Um, but typically Saudi, UAE, Iran, Egypt and Algeria are always good bets. You keep seeing that that remain at a pretty high level. 
I, I wanted to weave into that as you eloquently framed it, Jonathan. Um, of course, Egypt, Suez Canal and access and, you know, the whole market as one of the largest populations. Algeria, my head immediately goes to gas and, you know, how, from your vantage point, sitting across the Persian Gulf, how tangible you in your gut and in your, you know, um, crystal ball think that this um, um, uh, comprehensive partnership of 25 years and 400 billion with JCPOA, without JCPOA, somewhere in between, how tangible is this as, you know, um, as, as a, a astute observer, in your opinion? Will this be again another headline or it will happen, hook or crook? I think it, I think it has, so it will happen. It's important for China, right? They, they, they don't give these, these um, designations out at that level uh, like candy, right? Like a lot of countries want that and they don't get it. So an example is, I believe it was in 2015, uh, the Qatari Emir went to Beijing and they elevated to a strategic partnership and when he went back in 2019, it was very clear that he was looking for an upgrade. This was, you know, after two years of, of you know, the, the isolation. And uh, Xi Jinping had just been to Abu Dhabi and elevated the UAE to the top level. You could see that the Qatari Emir wanted the same, the same deal and he didn't get it. China said, we're very comfortable with you where you are. And I'm sure that that was that graded in Doha because, you know, the UAE got this and we didn't. Um, but I think the, the reason for that was that, you know, uh, Qatar was isolated, so it doesn't connect the way I was just describing. And also it was seen as a troublesome relationship. It would be China wading into a difficult situation. So it's not something they give away lightly. And the fact that they did do this with Iran, so they've been working on it since early 2016. It took five years to sign. Um, this mostly is because of the U.S. pressure on Iran and the U.S. pressure on China. Um, we could talk about that, I guess, but I think the bigger issue is it is real. They signed it, they're implementing it, um, but how far it goes, I mean, having it is one thing, but doing, doing anything tangible with it is, is another. And you look at the Saudi or the UAE strategic partner, or comprehensive strategic partnerships, you know, the Saudis, they immediately put this, what they call a high level joint committee and the vice premier of China and the crown prince of Saudi were co-chairs and they immediately operationalized it. They had meetings every year. They're signing tens of billions of dollars in, of MOUs. The next meeting, those things are become contracts. The next meeting, they become like something tangible happening. And you've seen the same thing with the UAE. You know, Khaldun Mubarak was, was made the special presidential envoy to China. Uh, Yang Jiechi, state counselor, former foreign minister was given the, the UAE portfolio. You know, this is indicative of very important bilateral relationships. Uh, with Iran, what happens, I think, will depend on the JCPOA because the investment in the trade that, that this deal is premised on can't come into play if, if Iran is under sanctions. You know, what about China's a barter, Jonathan? Could it turn into energy for goods and products as long as there is very little American content in it? Do you think it, that would it be? It could be, but I mean, you know, that's going to be very unsatisfying for Iran, right? They don't want, <laughs> they don't want that kind of, you know, they want, they want things being built. They want their companies having access to markets. You know, they don't want to be sneaking out like a girlfriend to the, you know, in the next morning kind of thing. They want like a proper relationship. So I think if, in my thinking, you know, uh, and Anush and I spoke about this recently, I think that the way Beijing is looking at this is dangling a carrot saying, we can give you a lot if you come back to JCPOA, if you know, if you come to deal with the US, not if you come back to JCPOA, obviously that's, that's on Washington. Um, but if you can strike a deal with the US and if, if you can live up to the, to, to the um, obligations and start acting like a normal country in the region, look at what you stand to, to benefit. But I don't think China is going to sacrifice it's much deeper political cooperation with GCC countries, or it's much deeper economic interests with the GCC countries just to, you know, crack into the Iranian market. I mean, they've been working on these GCC relationships for decades. They're not going to scupper that just, you know, to, to make deeper relations with the country that most of the world has deep problems with. Right. So, so uh, that's really interesting, Jonathan. So from, from Beijing's perspective, how do they manage 
contain the intergulf competition. And the competition is not just about Iran and the GCC. I see it also in terms of intra-GCC competition, but right. also we never talk about Iraq. When you look at some of China's latest investments within the BRI framework, Iraq seems to have been coming out of nowhere to take bronze and nearly silver. So mm -hmm. how is China managing the complexities of this part of the world, having been there for such a short period of time when it took the West a hundred years to try and come to terms with it. In the end, the West didn't. It ended up going to war more than four times uh, here. It's pretty skillful, right? To, to watch how China's navigating this, this terrain. I would just add when you're saying not just, you know, Iran versus GCC or GCC versus other GCC, but you can look inside countries and how um, different cities are, are trying to engage with Chinese projects to, to attract investment. And you almost see, you know, uh, different cities within countries are, are, are competing with each other. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving parts. I think the question of how China is, is navigating it, um, when you look at how Western countries and specifically the US, you know, the US has always used this balancing approach, right? And China hasn't. China's been hedging the way I see it. They've used strategic hedging, which you can do when you're not expected to, to assume a leadership position. If you are a second tier power, you can come into the region and just try not to, you know, dis disrupt this ecosystem. And so what China does is says, look, we're not here to play politics. We're not here to change the place. We just want to deal with it as we see it. And we're going to do business with everybody and we're going to support everybody and, and not try to alienate or isolate anybody. And because of this, I think that's why it's perceived as a neutral country. But as I was just kind of hinting in the last question, I don't see it as neutral at all. It does have preferences, it does play favorites. And those favorites are countries that tend to meet its broader objectives. So. The UAE, I think, is its is its favorite. You know, the UAE is the the place where it has the deepest footprint, the most diverse footprint, uh, huge expatriate population, thousands of businesses. You know, they enjoy the logistics hub, they enjoy the media city where they have their their head, headquarters for a lot of companies. So it doesn't it does play favorites, but I think it also sees that when other countries have have balanced or tried to take a more aggressive political role to try to change things, it's gotten them in trouble. Um, so it kind of feeds into this idea like, look, we're, we're, we're not like other powers. We're not trying to force you into anything. We're just here to engage with you economically and developmentally. That's, that's, I know Ali's, Ali's uh, uh, jumping to, 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 to fire questions and, and he's jumping at the point is that you, uh, uh, but following, following from that, Jonathan, just two brief ones, by the way, we want to talk about the UAE in, in, in great depth. So I'm glad that you've already put it on the agenda, but in terms of managing expectation of these regional regional powers, so what was all this, you know, the foreign minister's visit in Beijing all about? Because they seem to have been compartmentalized uh, when they arrived there. Um, I didn't get a sense that the Iranian foreign minister came across his GCC counterparts or the Chinese blended these guys into any any format. So what happens when they orchestrate these meetings from their perspective, but also how would they respond if Iran turns to Beijing and says, we really need support in terms of countering this particular, for example, cyber warfare against them, where they feel that you know China now owes them. How does the Chinese, diplomatic response bats that kind of question if and when it arises? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, because again, I think we look at it as China in the Gulf, but I think you know you, you always have to look at that other level where you know it's not just about China and, and individual Gulf countries, but the bigger picture is China and the US. And you know, so when China has offered support to Iran in the past, um, I've often seen it as they're building Iran's value as a bargaining chip to get something out of Washington. Uh, so I, I imagine a lot of Gulf countries have seen that pattern over the years and, and think, okay, well, we can use China as well as, as some kind of leverage in our relations with Iran. 
Um, you saw, I believe it was about 10 or 12 years ago, when you know, Saudi was saying, look, we can give you, if, if you stop buying, buying uh, energy from Iran, we can give you a much better deal. You know, we can, get, we can uh, meet the capacity you know, or the bat of an eye, it, it's not going to be a problem for us. So, you know, I think what they've done is they've taken a lot of these investment opportunities and free zones and they've taken, they've, they've really sweetened the deal to say, look, we're not telling you who to be friends with. If you want to be a partner with Iran, you can be a partner with Iran, but, you know, you can come here and you can, you can come into Jebel Ali and you can set up a regional headquarters that connects you to everything and all these regional contracts that you can get. I think the Gulf countries have played it pretty deftly, you know, they've, they've, been able to incentivize China to come down on their side on most things. So I think if if China does feel the need to support on Iran on, on a thing or two, you know, like it, it doesn't, I think Beijing will always, you know, be, be looking at it on those two levels. How's it going to affect their bilateral relations with the Saudis or the Emiratis? And how is this going to hurt them with, with Washington, which is, I think, always the bigger picture. Jonathan, um... Tapping into your wisdom, I wanted to press you a bit and um, perhaps help uh, me understand at least. When you talk about the carrot uh, that using, you know, uh, this project that, hey, if you do this and if you behave with US, we will help you uh, along our strategic partnership. Isn't there a counter carrot from Iran's optics as well for the reconstruction of Syria, Iraq, stability of Afghanistan, which are the continuation of BRI as well? Is there not, not an equal leverage, but as well perhaps a more balanced weight from Iran's optics in this relationship with China? Or do you think that Iran is just a bargaining chip because I always think that the stamina, the capital, and the audacity to rebuild these war-torn countries from Iraq, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, Yemen in future, this would be in Chinese domain. I don't see American companies coming and deploying as much as they want. Had they wanted to, they could have been doing that after 20 years, at least in Iraq and Afghanistan. What do you reckon? Well, I think you're right. Like you could see, you know, uh, Bashar al-Assad, I think maybe two, two Decembers ago went on TV and said, yeah, we're definitely going to work with China on BRI. And then again, when all of the foreign ministers were in, were, were in Wuxi last month, there was talk of Syria officially joining BRI. Uh, so there is obviously, and, and like Anoush mentioned with, with Iraq, you know, jumping into the metal standings, uh, they've been doing a lot of energy trade with Iraq for for a, for a long time. Iraq is is really up in the upper tier of those countries. You know, under those those five I mentioned, Iraq comes in quite close. So I think there is a lot of opportunity. And you're right. I think for for Iran with their political influence and their security influence in those those countries, I definitely think that's something that Beijing is thinking about. That you know, that it's not only about the opportunity. The positive opportunity it's also the negative opportunity right the, the threat of these places spiraling spills into other places which undermines china's interests so i think again if they look at iran and say look if we can if we can get you guys to be more in line with our vision of what regional stability looks like um this would be a benefit for a lot of countries i think and, I, I wanted to throw a bit of a humor there as you know, JCPOA talks have been five plus one. It, it, it seems like the other side is Iran is one plus five, you know, in the other countries that Iran has a, an inroad in it. But uh, thank you for that, Jonathan. Well, it's just one of the things I was going to say is, you know, the, the opposite effect is, has been made very clear to us because when Saudi Aramco was attacked uh, back in, my God, pre-pandemic time, so I guess two years ago, three years ago, um, you know, oil prices spiked and China ended up spending close to hundred million a day in just that, that premium of you know, the, the extra cost of oil. So you can't tell me that somebody from Beijing didn't call somebody in Tehran and say, cut it out. You, know, you guys are really messing with us here and we can't absorb this indefinitely and, and keep supporting you if this is what you're going to do to us. So I'm sure that logic also, because it is such a fundam fundamentally asymmetrical relationship, right? Um, and I, I think Iran needs China a lot more than China needs Iran. Um, Iran is quite good at, at navigating that, but I think at the end of the day, um, the carrots are there, but China has a pretty substantial stick as well. 
but it's in a bind at the same time, right? Because you know, if you look at, for example, at the um, at the Houthis missile attacks mm -hmm. uh, near where you're sitting right now, to celebrate the arrival of the Israeli delegation to Abu Dhabi from their perspective, right? That must send nerve tinkles alive, not just in Washington, but probably even more so in Beijing, because unlike Washington. Beijing can't send uh, anti-missile uh, equipment to the UAE to offer that tangible protection. So Iran not only makes one of China's close allies vulnerable, but it encourages American military protection to arrive in places where China would very much like to be present. So Iran is very much kind of the spoiler in, from, from um, that perspective. Uh, to China's overall strategic objectives, because it against Iran's own interest, it encourages America's <laughs> entrenched right. military presence on the one hand, but also it reminds some of China's friends now that actually your security lies with Washington and not with Beijing. So when Beijing says, look guys, you know, we are not going to interfere in your business, that can't sound, it can't sound very sweet in, in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, in Riyadh in particular, while Iranian supported Houthis are firing this stuff around the place, right? Absolutely. So you made so many good points there. Um, you know, the fact that this actually isn't in Iran's interest, right? That, that you know, the Houthis are launching missiles into Abu Dhabi. Um, you know, actually undermines a lot of what Iran is trying to do right now in these meetings with the UAE to try to lo lower the temperature. So this, I think, feeds into the idea that, sure, they're, they're clients, I don't know if they're proxies, but they, you know, that they're doing this really hurts a lot of Iranians' interests because you're right. I don't know how many articles I saw in the Financial Times, the New York Times, everywhere for the past month since those Ushi meetings saying, as China, or sorry, as US pulls out, China fills the vacuum or China moves in. And you keep seeing these stories and people here kind of accept that as, as gospel, right? Oh, America's leaving and China's coming in. And I'm saying, who's knocking those missiles down? It's not Beijing, they don't do that, right? So the idea that, that you can make a post-American um, security order here is I think glaringly, <laughs> we've seen, very, very, very clearly that that's a little presumptuous. Uh, and, and again, you know, after those meetings, when Foreign Minister Wang Yi, you know, had its kind of, I felt a little smug saying, you know, there's no power vacuum in the Middle East and we're not like other powers, you know, Middle Easterners should rule the Middle East. And, and you know, yeah, again, that, like you said, it sounds sweet. It, it, of course, in a region that's always been historically penetrated, you like to hear a great power say, we're not going to treat you like this. But at the same time, there is a power vacuum, right? There is this, this very, very competitive regional environment with very, very strong security threats. And right now it requires the support of an extra regional power to, to balance that. And China's made it very clear they don't see themselves in that way. So I think if anything, if, if Iran were strategically let's, you know, saying to the Houthis, go for it, all it's doing is making the American footprint that much deeper, I think. Jonathan, um, a great part of economic development and growth, at least for a foreseeable future, um, is still dependent on fossil fuels. And a lot of people are, you know, enamored with net zero, but as soon as the inflation goes up and then they realize that, oh, it's the house is cold, uh, the, the reality comes back to bite that, you know, it's all about at least as a transition fuel, uh, LNG and gas will be there. How much of all these movements and China's ambitions are interdependent to energy security, Babel Manda, Persian Gulf, and the whole thing? And how much of these um, saber rattlings, even with Russia from where you are sitting, will influence the significance and importance of gas producing countries like Qatar, or the future relevance of Iran, which has the second largest gas reserves in the world, but less than 1% of market share in global gas markets. How, how do you see these energy cards 
being played. I know that we all want to not associate Middle East or West Asia as a single pony show for oil and gas, but that's the reality still. What do you think? Yeah, well, it is. It's, it's local economies are still, I mean, they're trying to get past it, right? Um, again, you look at Saudi 2030, when it was announced in 2015, and they said by year whatever, we are, we're going to be this far along. Of course, nobody saw the pandemic, but you know, 2030 is not that far off anymore. When, when they announced it, it sounded like, ooh, the future. We'll all be, you know, in our, <laughs> with Elon Musk going to Mars. Um, so, you know, the reality is, it's like you said, it's really hard. Even if we start to transition off of hydrocarbons, you know, everything we're made is built with plastics and stuff that uses this stuff, right? So I don't see that changing anytime soon. And PRC, you know, to keep that in engine running, the economy, you know, it's 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 running on fuel, right? And that's that they're they have very very real domestic political pressures in China, which is why we're seeing all of these things that Xi Jinping's been rolling out the past couple of years with this common prosperity and trying to recreate their domestic political economy. They're going to be very reliant on on Gulf imports to achieve that. So, absolutely, that dynamic's not going to change. Um, but going back to what I said earlier about that, that bigger picture with the US, the fact that they've re reached this strategic competition framework in DC. And when you look at the Trump administration's trade war with China, I think that was a big wake up call for, for Beijing to realize that trade is a weapon now, not a, not a tool, but a weapon being used against it. You know, I think at that point, up until that point, China seemed very satisfied. Again, not just hedging in the Gulf, but hedging in bigger picture, not trying to disrupt America's, you know, so-called Pax Americana. We get a lot out of that, right? We don't have to patrol the Indian Ocean. We can just let our our SOEs go and make a lot of money and and ship it back. Um, that calculus, I think, had changed, and we're seeing China's Navy start to behave a, a, a little more assertively. And and it's probably these commercial ports across the IOR, you know, with whether it's Gwadar or, or whatever, Dukum, um, I don't know anything about this stuff, but I assume it's not that hard to turn it into a dual purpose facility where maybe their Navy could be using those as well. So it is important to China. It's the lifeblood of their economy. And I think if they're pushed, they're going to have to secure, they're going to have to make provisions to securitize that. And uh, so it could get, oh, I think that's one of the, the dangers of the strategic competition framework is, is it's, it's kind of um, targeting the Indo-Pacific as a priority theater, which is fair, that's, 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 that's reasonable. But other regions become these secondary theaters and that's when it gets messy. And I think the Gulf in particular and the broader Middle East really looks like a, a secondary theater of a lot of uh, importance for both of those countries. On, 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 on that note, Jonathan, um, relating to what Ali was talking about, uh, natural gas in particular, and, and, and so on. So first, do you think the Chinese are really annoyed with Russia's uh, maneuvers in, in Ukraine, which is having such a deleterious impact on energy markets globally? And you said earlier that resonates in China very strongly, first. And secondly, given that Iran's gas market is closed off to the West, given that the Russians will not want it to emerge to compete with theirs either. And given that Sheikh Tamim goes to Washington to satisfy Europe's gas demand, why aren't Iran and China seeing this as a golden opportunity for Iran becoming in many ways, China's core provider of natural gas. And in that context, then, is the GSEOPOA the only thing that will then enable China to make sure that Iran's gas becomes this long-term backup, irrespective of global energy prices, because within the GSEOPOA and within their own 25-year agreement, they can lock down prices in terms of China's interest? Yeah, I mean, just the way you framed it, I think answers it itself, right? This is a really important opportunity for both those countries. And, you know, I, I haven't actually read it yet. I've, I've got the Russia or the Putin Xi statement sitting here on my desk because 
I actually have an article or a report coming out, I believe next week on Russia, China, and MENA. And, uh, you know, it's something that I think a lot of us are looking at. What, how are Russia and China engaging the region? And is there any kind of coordination there? And, and are they in cahoots? And when you hear about these trilateral engagements with, with Iran and you think, well, that, that looks scary, right? These three revisionist powers are going to up, up in the apple cart and it's gonna be a, a disaster. Um, but I think there's a lot of space between each of those. I think China and Iran make a much better uh, partner than Russia and Iran. You know, as you both know all too well, Russia and Iran have not liked each other very much for a very long time. And, you know, what's been going on recently, I think, is, is really more of a fair weather friend scenario. And I think it's the same thing with China and Russia, right? Which also, of course, just, you know, what, whatever it was 50 years ago, are ready to go to war together, you know, ready to start dropping nukes on each other. Uh, I, I think that what, what the, what's driving them together is, is really just concern about, you know, the met, uh, pressures from, from the U.S. particularly, uh, destabilizing them um, domestically. So I, I think the Russia-China thing, I, I hope, but I think it's quite exaggerated. And I think China and Iran actually do line up pretty nicely, especially, as you say, on this, on this LNG portfolio. It could really- Jonathan, how can China, um, given its clout, given its you know, um, potential weight and strategic alliance with Iran and securing West Asia, give as the second economy in the world, soon to be the first in terms of size and might, any assurances to Iran that Washington itself cannot give that, hey, in two years, the deal will last. So how much of leverage <laughs> would that give to Beijing that, hey, you know what, behave, I will give you the 400 uh, billion in 25 years, sign the deal, be a good boy, and they say, well, wait a minute, they can't keep their promise. How can you shepherd us to a deal that somebody else may leave the table? And on that note as well, do you feel from your um, um, assessment that there is a genuine appetite for mending fences in the GCC with Iran at the moment? Or it's again, a, a development of convenience? Hmm. I think it's a development of inconvenience because I think they're all looking at the US leaving Afghanistan. Every time I talk to anybody in Abu Dhabi, that's one of the talking points. It really undermined a lot of people's confidence. And uh, I, I get that that's always a, a feature in any asymmetrical partnership. You're always worried about being abandoned by your more powerful partner. But you know, the US presence here, I think was, was founded on a certain strategic environment you know, during the Cold War and then the, the, the immediate post-Cold era. And the landscape's changed a lot. America's interests aren't the same as they were 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, that could change if they do enter this Cold War dynamic with China and, and they pull out the old Cold War playbook. But you know, the US had to be here to get global or to get Gulf energy to global markets to support their economy and to you know, ensure uh, freedom of navigation and to protect Israel. And those were, I think, its three main strategic interests in the Middle East. And those three things have changed a lot in recent years. You know, um, Gulf energy is, is, is being used by a lot of Asian powers, as, as we all know. Those countries are probably able to play a bigger role in, in securing it. Um, freedom of navigation, the same deal. We've seen a lot of different um, articulations of plans to, to you know, stabilize the waters and patrol the waters, and it doesn't have to be the U.S. doing it. And Israel's never been safer in, in, in its history, from its, its neighbors at least. Uh, it seems more and more every day it's getting uh, in, in a better situation. So I think everybody looks at that and realizes the U.S. doesn't have to play the same type of foot, uh, role it always has. And then you see what people in the States are saying about their over-militarized forever wars and and all these, these uh, arguments within the domestic political realm in the US about what kind of international role it wants. So everybody looks at it and says, you know, it's, it's about to get a lot more turbulent. So I think to me, that explains why they would look at Iran and say, this is something we got to sort out on, on our own because, you know, things are about to get a lot more unnerving if, if we maintain this level, this heightened level of tension forever, you know, it could get very, very, uh, um, 
it could go from competition to conflict pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I absolutely is 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 a clear concern uh, in that regard, Jonathan. Uh, but of course, you mentioned Afghanistan. I don't think it would have been lost on on folks in Abu Dhabi that it was in fact Doha which facilitated huh. the return of the Taliban and the peaceful departure of the United States forces from uh, Kabul either. So in that context, do you think now that the Qataris are arriving at the party a bit late, uh, UAE feels that it has to up its game in relation to China in particular, because the Americans have not abandoned the close military ties with Qatar, far from it, actually, looking at the more recent developments. Um, so does, does the UAE now see that the dynamics are changing and that it needs to become a bit more proactive? But also relating to the UAE, I've been dying to ask you, what makes the UAE so special and so different from its neighbors? Hmm. Okay, well, there's a lot there. So with Doha, yeah, I think they've, they've, we've seen Qatar diplomatically playing a, a really good game, you know, over the past year or so. And I do think that that's changing the calculus, uh, not just, you know, beyond the region, but within as well. So, you know, you see Qatari researchers moving around again, which is great. And you see a lot of, of natural relationships that are being reestablished. Uh, I have a friend in Doha who said that, you know, when, when she goes to the supermarket, you see, you know, they really emphasize, you know, these are Saudi products, you know, um, and things are, are, and you see like travel agencies promoting tourism into other GCC countries. So it has changed and great. I'm, I'm, I, we've all been due, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to see. I don't think that really changes the calculus for the UAE vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with China, just because they've done such a great job of deepening that. Um, and the Qatar, the Qataris, you know, uh, are, are still starting from a pretty low level. You know, so China's trade with the UAE is, is vastly, vastly larger than that with Qatar. And its construction contracting and its investment is, is significantly more. So, you know, Qatar, I think, has a lot of ground to make up. Um, and I don't know that it, you know, I don't know that it will, because what makes the UAE special for China, there's, there's a lot. I mean, I just received, just as I was coming on to talk to you guys, uh, the mailman arrived with a book for me, and it's written by a, a really brilliant prof at American University of Sharjah. Her name is Wang Yu Ting, and she published a book a year ago um, called The Chinese in Dubai. And she's a, a Chinese sociologist. She's, she's been in, in, in Sharjah for, I believe, about 12 years, and she's been researching Chinese communities. And I can't wait to read this book because she's got so many great stories that show just how entrenched these Chinese communities are. So the idea is that you know, they're, they're here to make a buck and then they make their buck and they leave. Um, but they have, you know, families that are, you know, multi-generational families who are based in Dubai. Um, there are two distinct Chinatowns in Dubai where they've got, you know, a long history there. So there's a lot going on. I mean, Dubai last year just opened the first Chinese international school, like the first state sponsored international school. And that's because they've got a huge population in Dubai, you know, two or between two and 300,000. So, I mean, I think that's the big reason why is, of course, Dubai has always been very, very good at, it's very nimble. You, you want to access the Saudi market, but you don't want to live under Saudi restrictions, come to Dubai. And you'll have a very shiny lifestyle with your champagne brunches and, you know, go to church, go to mosque, go to whatever. Um, there was a, a, a quote from a Chinese banker years ago, just saying, look, most of our contracts are in Saudi, but our headquarters are in Jebel Ali. And that's because, you know, our employees want to live here. We find it comfortable. We don't have to navigate, you know, a, a very different political and, and religious culture. So, you know, Dubai's been very good at this over the years. And, you know, Riyadh's been pushing back, we've seen in recent years, and trying to trying to reduce uh, the attractiveness of, of some of what UAE offers. And then the UAE just turns it around and says, oh, we're going to change our social laws, or we're going to change the weekend or we're going to do any number of things to, to make it easier for people to live here. Um, so that's been a big part of it. You know, China's been taking advantage of that. And then you look at, again, Jebel Ali is, is the region's premier port. It is every year for the past God knows how many years. They've got all these free zones. 
Um, it's easy place to invest. It's an easy place to do business. The laws are, are very uh, clear. And it's got great logistics connecting it to the rest of the region. And then you see, again, the, the, the last thing I guess I'd bring up is when the Abraham Accords were announced, a lot of people in the US described it as a, a diplomatic triumph of the Trump administration. They, they pulled these two together uh, against all odds. And this is, uh, you know, in the zero sum logic, America wins, China loses. And I immediately thought, well, China, this is great for China. You know, look at how they're cooperating with Israel and the UAE on, on vaccines, on, on AI, on any number of things. If the UAE and Israel start to cooperate and start to, to you know, create this infrastructure that connects them, of course, China's going to piggyback. So, you know, it's been great for them to see, you know, the UAE behaving this way diplomatically because it also supports other things they're doing. So I think, yeah, China, China looks at the UAE as a place that they're comfortable doing business with. And I don't think that's always true with a lot of the neighbors. So that kind of explains it. I remember a good more than a decade ago, um, Jonathan, uh, at an ATM in Burj Al Arab, when you realized that there are only three languages on the ATM machine, Mandarin, uh, English, and Arabic. That is almost 10 years ago. And you realize that they, they're way ahead of their game. Yeah. I want to ask you a um, a question related to um, great game theory and, you know, the significance of that, how you articulately mentioned, you know, the Cold War, the Gulf uh, energy significance and yeah, protecting the maritime sea routes and, you know, the protection of the Holy Land and Israel. Many of those things have been secured and changed and America no longer depends on the Persian Gulf energy as it used to 30, 40 years ago. Wouldn't in that context, in a Machiavellian way, the security of energy of the past that was vital in America's prosperity, weight, and might, could today turn into a card for US that insecurity of that L4, L5 would be the leverage against China? Yeah, well, I, I think that's what we're seeing with this strategic competition framework is, is a way to increase the cost of China doing business here, right? China's been able, like I said, they've been able to opportunistically develop these deep ties without any kind of political or military commitments. They've done it on America's back. Um, I think what we've seen since 2019 is the US starting to push back. And it's been, um, frankly, a little disconcerting to watch while being here because it does seem to be, you know, I, I, whenever I hear people talk in these zero sum dynamics as an academic, I get nervous, but that, that's what we're seeing more and more where they're saying, look, if you're gonna work with them on, on 5G or if you're gonna let them build a military installation or if you're going to let them manage a port or manage any critical infrastructure, these are the consequences. And I understand that from America's perspective, um, but I also think I understand it from Gulf countries' perspectives, the Middle Eastern countries' perspectives, that they don't want to be put in a position where they have to choose, because they do have they get a lot from both sides, yeah. you know, and I think that's true of most of us, right? I mean, I, I keep referring to it as great power narcissism because Beijing and and Washington they seem to forget that there's about 200 other countries that yeah. don't necessarily see things the same way they do. Yeah. Um, and this affects us in, 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 in a lot of ways as well. But I think what, um, what that means for Gulf countries is they're going to be put in a pretty uncomfortable position unless they can find a way to, to convince these great powers that they're, they're behaving irrationally and they need a nap or a snack and you know come back when you're feeling better. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be so dismissive of it. I, I think there are a lot of really serious issues at, 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 at stake here. And I think America is not actually wrong on a lot of it. I think China's behavior is pretty um, concerning for a lot of us, but I think China also does have legitimate interests and it does provide legitimate public goods in a lot of ways. So it's not as simple as saying, you know, good guy, bad guy. And I think actors in, in the Middle East uh, feel that very acutely. So it is going to be tough. It's going to be something that I think is going to drive a lot of regional politics for, you know, probably for the rest of my career. That's, that's, that's 
spot on, Jonathan, on 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 so many levels. So, so in that regard, then my my final uh, comment uh, for you, Jonathan, is, you know, they haven't, you know, that is Washington and Beijing haven't managed to get their act together over the Korean Peninsula, which remains an open wound after so long. Yeah. Do you fear that, you know, West Asia could become another Korean Peninsula crisis? Um, but let me flip it also. Do you at the same time see that JCPOA is not really about Iran, but it's actually about an opportunity for mm. Russia, for China and for United States to try to get their heads around finding a modus operandi in this part of the world? Yeah, I think that's a really good observation. You know, I don't think, again, like I've said earlier, I think that a lot of what China's doing with Iran is, is looking at Washington, you know, and I think you're right that there are, it's, it's of course, the bilateral is important, but I think the, the bigger picture is, is always, how are these great powers going to find a way to, to, to you know, coexist? On the Korea Peninsula question, I mean, I actually lived in Korea for five years. I lived there for a big chunk of my 20s, and I love Korea uh, desperately. Um, so the metaphor is important to me, but I think the difference is that, you know, for, for PRC, North Korea serves a lot of really important functions, you know, chief of which is that a lot of very important, you know, Communist Party history is based on the heroics of of what they did in Korea, you know, when they were still a young republic, so a lot of their a lot of their legitimacy is based on this. So they'd have to really rewrite the history books if if this changed. But you know, even Mao's son died in fighting in Korea, right? Um, but then the bigger issue for them is, of course, that a U.S. ally. If if North Korea collapses, then South Korea moves up, and the U.S. is right on the Yalu River, which they can't accept. So I think the difference there is not to go nerdy into Korean politics, but to, to PRC, North Korea is a, is a core interest. You know, it's, it's right on the border. And on the other side of that border is an American ally with a huge American military presence. So to them, that's, that's an existential one. The Gulf, I think, is, is you know, kind of maybe at a third level of, of, of interest for, for, the, for, for China. It's important, certainly, but it's not as important as their domestic pressures or you know, those 14 countries that they share a border with, most of which do not like or trust China very much. You know, so I think that's kind of the hierarchy for China is inside and then the borders, and then you know, you get to the next level and they, they look at the Gulf, so, or the Middle East rather. So it is very important to them. I don't see it having the same kind of uh, weight as those kind of early Cold War frustrations with the U or confrontations with the US just because it's not, as existential, but I do think it does lead into a lot of other bigger ideas. I mean, the fact that what seems to be driving it again, similar to the Cold War, is is ideology. You know, I think the Chinese are very worried about U.S. democracy promotion, liberalism promotion, and I think a lot of countries in the Gulf share those concerns. You know, when people from Washington visit and they say, you know, on a on a on a values level or on a normative level, Gulf countries are closer to us. And I keep saying, well, not really. You know, it's not like if you scratch beneath the surface, these guys are, are liberal Democrats at heart, right? I think their political culture is very similar to the Chinese political culture in a lot of ways. So in that case, there is kind of a, an ideological component to this that could play out here and, and kind of bring those pressures to the forefront. And if that's the case, then it becomes much more complex. Jonathan, I, I, while you were talking about the significance of uh, North Korea to China's security and you know proximity, it reminded me of the tension that we are facing today with uh, Russia and the encroachment of NATO and the whole dialogue there. And this uh, acronym popped into my head, you know, that uh, NPTO, that the uh, North Pacific. Uh, <laughs> Treaty organization. I don't think China, having learned everything from uh, Russia, would allow that or see that in, in its own uh, or in our lifetime. But let me wrap up. We were very much enjoying listening to you and from where you are sitting and envying you for that, son, as you rightly said, yeah. and the temperatures. From where you are sitting as um, uh, political um, 
economist, as a, a somebody academic, as somebody who understands and gets a global view, but from where you are sitting, not discounting your Asia and Korean expertise and insights, which was refreshing to listen to. What is your advice to people who may be tuning into our program to the cinephobes and cinephiles. If you were to leave them with one piece of advice regarding West Asia and Middle East to both camps of cinephobes and cinephiles from where you are sitting, what would that advice be? Yeah, well, I guess it would be to, to try to use a little bit of strategic empathy and understand the choices actors are making and the reasons for them, right? Like I. It's a tough balance. I mean, you guys know it better than anybody. Uh, if you're talking about Iran, you're going to get slammed from either side, right? The people who who can't accept that anything good can come from Iran or the people, so you're the apologist for the regime or if you criticize it, you're anti. And the same dynamic exists with, you know, people who, who work on China. It's pretty hard to, you, you're either a panda hugger or a panda slugger. And I think both those are pretty dumb. I mean, I understand it, but I think, again, if you if if you look at polling data that's on the Arab barometer or the Africa barometer in the past couple of years, what you see is a lot of countries in, in the Middle East, a lot of countries in Africa have pretty positive views of China. And that's not propaganda, it's not politicized. They're they're getting stuff they need, right? So if you understand that, if you can understand that not everybody sees the China threat the same way Washington does. Um, it, it goes a long way to understanding how it is that this country that that seemingly, you know, that that does do a lot of dodgy stuff also does some good stuff, you know, and and I think the US policy of engagement for, for whatever it was, 40 plus years, was the right one. I hope we get back to that someday. I understand the pressures coming from Xi Jinping's China make that very, very hard. But you know, what was that heart of engagement? was Chinese behavior would change over time as it became more entrenched in this, you know, this, this liberal world order. It's not that China's gonna become liberal or that China's going to become democratic, it's that China's going to start behaving in a way that's consistent with the norms of everybody else that's, that's benefiting from this. And you can't say China wasn't moving in that direction because that's why she has cracked down so hard. They were losing control, people were starting to, you know, ask for more from their state. People were starting to behave in ways that was harder and harder for the CCP to maintain its control. So that explains to me the crackdown and, and it shows that actually they were on the right track. So, you know, um, it's kind of a long-winded answer that's gone off into the, into the weeds here. But the fact is, I think a lot of countries in, in the global South see China very differently from capital cities do in, in, in Europe and in the UK and in Washington and in Canada. And it's important to understand that. Very interesting. I, I'm going to stop because I know Anush is coming in to bring it to a, an elegant conclusion, as he always does. But listening to you and talking about the goods, and the, I, I see China mostly in a Tai Chi mode and America in Chuck Norris, you know, <laughs> it just comes in, And these two have a hard time having a dialogue. You know, one needs a bit of concentration and patience and inhalation. And you may get whacked in between, don't take me wrong. But the other one comes in, you know, so these two, the reconciliation of them is going to be interesting in the years to come. Well, it's, inshallah, we'll see it soon. Yeah, it's a yin yang. You know, the irony is, of course, that it was America that facilitated China's rise right. uh, where it is. And they should take pride in that because they accommodated China so well as to turn it into a major global power. Now all they have to do is share the world rather than compete for it in, in, in many ways. Uh, Jonathan, mm. this was absolutely brilliant, brilliant discussion we've had with you. Uh, I, I should note that your latest book, your prolific author, researcher, um, the, the handbook that we produced with Routledge is outstanding. It Thank you. is a treasure trove of analysis that you edited 26 articles, nearly 300 pages of text. You've gathered together some of the most noted experts in the field to contribute, which says a lot about your abilities and respect with which you're held in the community. So that's, and we've seen it in spades this afternoon with us as well. 
And I know that you also work on this issue with the Atlantic Council. Mm -hmm. You have your podcast that I know well, right. uh, and I look forward to, to development of that as well. So we are really grateful that you've given so much of your time to us and so generously your mind as well. And, and we hope to see you. I would love to see you in Abu Dhabi, of course, um, personal interest declared here. Uh, mm -hmm. But 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 hopefully we'll have a chance to speak with you again on BRI dialogues on this range of issues that you monitor so closely and have so many interesting insightful views to share with us out here. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much. I see two guitars in the background. I just wanted to say, despite the fact you didn't play them today, your insights were music to our ears. So thank you for that. Next episode will be like an hour-long concert of me playing Freebird. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, guys, so much. Really enjoyed this.